Hi, and welcome to today's event. I'm Talib Jabbar, an associate editor at Zocalo Public Square. Here at Zocalo, our mission is to connect people to ideas and to one another. Everything we do is free and everyone is welcome. We publish original writing and present conversations like this one. You can find us at zocalopublicsquare.org and all major podcast platforms. And if you enjoy this conversation, please like it, follow us, and subscribe. We're excited to present today's conversation. Is there still merit in a merit-based system? New Yorker staff writer Nicholas Lemon will be leading and moderating our discussion. He is Dean and Professor at the Columbia Journalism School, the founding director of Columbia World Projects, and the author of The Big Test, The Secret History of the American Meritocracy. He will be introducing our discussion and panelists. Over to you, Nick. Okay, uh, welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Nick Lemon. I'm the moderator of this discussion, uh, which is called, Is There Any Merit in a Merit-Based System? Um, the reason I'm serving as moderator is that I wrote a book uh, about meritocracy more than 20 years ago. Um, and I still write about these issues. Um, when I um, was working on my book, which was mostly through the 1990s, I would tell people uh, what I was working on and about half the time they would have a totally blank look on their face. Um, and I, I don't know if it's, it's still that way or whether the word sort of lands, uh, but it lands in different ways with different people as we will bring out. Um, so I'm gonna very briefly introduce our panelists and then we'll get right into it. The very end of the hour, not the very end, but closer to the end, we'll be uh, taking questions from those of you who are in the audience. So please send in your questions and then they'll get sent to me and then I'll ask some of them in the final uh, part of the, of the seminar. Um, okay, Adrian Wooldridge is the author of the new book, The Aristocracy of Talent, How Meritocracy Made the Modern World. He's currently the political editor of The Economist, where he writes the Badgett column, Analyzing British Life and Politics. He spoke at the very first Zocalo event in 2003. Jennifer Lee is a sociologist and Julian Clarence Levy Professor of Social Sciences at Columbia University. Her work focuses on Asian immigration in the United States, and she is the co-author of the book, The Asian American Achievement Paradox, which received five National Book Awards. She's a past president of the Eastern Sociological Society. And Melissa R. Clinton is the senior vice president, general counsel, and secretary of the Aerospace Corporation. She is also the current chair of the board of the Aerospace Diversity Action Committee. In her role at, at the Aerospace Corporation, she provides leadership and oversight to the senior management team on issues related to compliance, strategy, ethics, mission, and culture. Thanks, everybody. And I'm, I'm just going to start by trying to pin down, if it can be done, what is this thing we're calling meritocracy? So I'm going to ask each of you to say, uh, in effect, sort of kidding, what does meritocracy mean to you? And um, I'm also sort of kidding, are you for it or again it? Uh, so I'm going in counterclockwise on my screen and your screen too. So I'll ask Adrian first, what is it? Well, the term meritocracy was coined by a very brilliant and eccentric British sociologist called Michael Young in 1958 in his book, The Rise of the Meritocracy. And he defined meritocracy or merit, he defined merit as IQ plus effort. Uh, I would agree with that, but I would say merit is IQ plus effort minus bias. Uh, and I would say a meritocratic system is one which judges people according to their promise uh, and then promotes them according to their achievement. I would say a meritocratic system is also one which tries its very best to provide a quality of opportunity through a mass educational system. Uh, and I would also just add to that that I'm very strongly in favor of merit, both as a good in itself and as a safeguard against all sorts of evils such as nepotism, corruption, and favoritism. Okay, um, Melissa, same question. What is meritocracy? 
Uh, so I would say it's it's not what we're practicing now, certainly in the United States, um, for the reasons that Adrian said. Uh, and the, the big, biggest example of that is that most of my peers in the C-suite um, and at all at most companies and at academic institutions and at publications are white men. Um, I know for a fact that Jennifer and I can compete with white men and so can a lot of other people who look like us. So the fact that we're not able to and that we're the exception and not the rule, the fact that you look at you, if you live on this soil, we've been diverse for quite some time and yet the upper echelons are owned by exclusively uh, by one group means that we're not, we're not practicing a meritocracy at all. It's just not what we're doing. What would fix that problem? I mean, that's a big question, but just to follow up. I, I, it, what the fix is going to happen, the fix is going to take a different sort of input for certain people, and it's got to start from the cradle and go to the grave. That I know it's got to start from the cradle and go to the grave. If you really want true competition, where only the best and the brightest achieve the status that we have on this call, um, you've got to give people a shot from the cradle, not a disadvantage, but a shot. Um, Jennifer, what is meritocracy? Oh, I'm glad I'm third. I have to say that this is, uh, I'm already excited about this discussion. I would say that in a meritocratic system, equality of opportunity would generate a high degree of both social stratification and social mobility because talent, however we're defining it, unconstrained by ascriptive characteristics and social origins would rise to the top. That is the ideal type definition of what meritocracy is. The fact that we're not seeing Talent rise to the top, net of social characteristics and social origins says we're not practicing the ideals by which we believe we are a meritocracy. So everybody that I'm hearing believes in meritocracy, yeah. maybe with an asterisk. Um, so let me test you first a little bit on that, okay? So imagine, you know, different fields of endeavor are, are, are structured in different ways. Imagine the whole world were structured in the way of being an actor, let's say. Uh, so in other words, this, there's this term uh, superstar economics. So let's say hypothetically, you're in a field where 80% of the people are dead broke and waiting tables. Uh, 19% are sort of scraping by and 1% are really rich, but their success is fairly achieved. Are you okay with that? Are you okay with extreme inequality if it is achieved meritocratically or is there a place where you kind of hit your limit on that? Um, well, shall I say, first of all, I'm very surprised uh, and gratified actually that everybody here seems to be in favor of meritocracy. Uh, particularly given that there's a, a very strong movement against meritocracy, not as something that we're not achieving, but as an ideal in itself. So we have two very influential books, um, Markowitz's book on the meritocracy trap uh, and the book on the tyranny of merit, um, which um, argues that meritocracy is not the sort of thing that, 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 that people want. And I'm interested that we, 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 we're not going down that, that, that road, or those roads, or, or at least yet. Um, I think there's a great line in the in the in the play Glen Gary Glen Ross, which says that the 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 winner gets a Cadillac, the the person who's number two gets a set of steak knives, and the person who's number three, you're fired, uh, right. and that that is a, a sort of meritocracy. But I don't think that's a meritocracy that makes for a very attractive society. So there's, there's, there's a degree to which you skew rewards to. Uh, people at the very top. And I think if you have a society which gives all the rewards to the one or two winners and nothing to anybody else, uh, that's not that's a repugnant society in many ways. But I think there's also uh, uh, much more seriously or much more profoundly uh, a problem with what we regard as merit. And if we have only one set of hierarchies of merit, um, let's say extreme academic achievement, and everything else is discounted. So your compassion, your skill at handicrafts, your ability to, 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 to um, run, run things, your organizational skills are all discounted. 
uh, that would be, uh, again, not a very good way of organizing society. And I think there's a, you know, one of the big problems with my own country, Britain, is that we've ha had a long system for a long, we've had a system for a long time of selection by elimination. So the people who do really well at the top get fantastic prizes and then other people are discarded along the way. And I think it's very important to, um, to replace selection by elimination with selection by differentiation. So different sorts of talent, different sorts of ability, get their appropriate rewards. So, well, so, again, so yeah, there's a bunch of things I want to ask about this, but I want to go back to the other panelists quickly yeah. and just say, is there, if we can stipulate that, results are fairly and meritocratically achieved, which I know we're not there, but if we were there, is there still a degree of inequality that would make you uncomfortable? I would say one thing. I think um, a couple of things that uh, Adrian said, and also the question, Nicholas, which <coughs> you raised, I think is based on this idea that we have agreed of what meritocracy is and how to measure it. And this is where I think there are problems when we think about there have, the whole definition of meritocracy has always shifted and Adrian's book has pointed that out and your work has certainly pointed that out that I think rather than thinking about meritocracy as a concrete thing that has not shifted in definition, um, that has not shifted to protect um, a certain kind of gendered or racialized or ethnicized hierarchy. Um, this this conversation, I'm not sure. I'm not sure that question is the one I would ask. I think how I would think about meritocracy is how has it shifted over time, such that we're reproducing certain kind of patterns that we're seeing today. Um, okay, I still think you're slightly dodging my question. <laughs> um, but uh, we can get back to that later. Um, uh, Melicia? So I feel like what you defined, Nicholas, was capitalism. Um, right. You didn't say that, but I, I feel like that's what you defined, yeah. right? And so there are the I one percenters, that. there's the 20%, and, um, uh, and then maybe there's, you know, middle America. Um, uh, I think there are markers that will tell you if that system, Nicholas, are broken. And I say, we have to pay attention to the markers. One of the markers is homelessness. If, if the meritocratic system allows millions of people to live under bridges and, and subsist, you know, barely exist, it's broken. If it allows, um, you know, uh, 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 you know, the owners of Facebook and Tesla to uh, have billions of, I don't care about them having that money as much as I care about so many people having not enough to get by. So I will, uh, my answer is yes, there's something wrong with that. There's something wrong with it. And you can call it capitalism. And by the way, the same issues arise in communism. It's that the system is flawed. You have to account for the fact that it's broken and it always will be. And mostly that's because I think humans are just selfish and we're prone to excess. We're okay having so much more than we need. So I, I would have a problem with it, short answer. Um, let me... My mind is crowded with the millions of things I want to ask you guys, So, uh, but it's fun. Uh, I want to go back to you, Adrian. In the book, as I read it, and if I'm misreading it, um, correct me, you are pretty comfortable with the first part of the Michael Young definition that IQ tests measure something real, which we can call intelligence intelligence or general intelligence, and this would be a sort of basis, basic quality in a meritocracy. On the other hand, I think I just heard you say we need to reward people for lots of different kinds of talents. So can you kind of square for me, on the one hand, having a, a, a kind of a sorting system early in life with IQ or IQ-like tests with the idea that we're going to um, you know, reward a lot of different talents. I mean, I'll go back to my acting uh, analogy. I remember once at the Oscars, Ellen DeGeneres was the host and she said, and this was back in the day when it was a bigger deal and it was packed hall. And she said, who here has a college degree? And they got a big laugh because nobody in the hall had a college degree, right? But on the other hand, some of them are 
really good actors. Some of them are have sort of animal spirits. Um, so just, are we okay with linking IQ and IQ testing to the search for talent and apportionment of opportunity in our society? So Adrian, this is going to you first, but the others as well. Sure. Well, first of all, I think it's absolutely essential in any uh, notion of a meritocracy that we make a distinction between people's promise and their achievement. That we have to have some notion that we're looking for qualities which are not very obvious. Um, we're looking for people's ability to learn, their ability to grow, their ability to get better. And that's why there's so much emphasis on selecting people early, on, on, on looking for these talents early in people's lives. Because the great danger of a meritocracy is that it simply perpetuates the status quo, particularly in the society in which education is a key variable, because it's very easy for the very educated to pass on those educational advantages for their children. So we need to try and break the link between origins, people's social origins and educational origins and their destinations. So how do we do that? We look yeah. for potential. Uh, and one of the ways that we can look for potential, I think is the IQ test. It's not the only way that we can look for potential. We can look through, look through it through various other mechanisms, but those mechanisms have to be geared towards making a distinction between what you know and your capacity to learn in the future. So that's why I'm looking at IQ tests. So that's why I, and why I'm looking for early signs of ability so we can find and focus on potential in the future. As for the issue of different sorts of talents, um, I think that there, there clearly are different sorts of talents and we, need to, and we need to look for those sorts of talents. And I've been very preoccupied by this in particular, but because there's a big revolt against meritocracy going on in, in the United States and Britain, uh, because it seems to produce an accumulation of privileges in the, in the hands of the very well-educated and leave other people by the side of the, the road. Whereas in, in Germany, which puts a lot of emphasis and gives a lot of status to apprenticeships and vocational education, you don't have anything like that degree of social, social discontent. So that's why I put the emphasis on looking for different sorts of talent, particularly people's um, uh, you know, vocational abilities or, or abilities in, 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 in vocationally oriented areas. But whatever one thinks of IQ tests, and we could easily have a, a, a very prolonged debate about this, and I know you've written a great deal about this yourself, is I think that there the has to be, to have a meritocracy, a mechanism for distinguishing between potential and achievement for the young. Um, do either of you want to add on on testing and IQ testing as and, and its role in a meritocracy? I guess I mean I, I I'm less apt to talk about IQ testing, more interested in talking about testing more generally. And so I think when we look at the history of testing, um, testing has typically disadvantaged Americans from poor socioeconomic backgrounds, and that tends to be conflated with class. And so, Nicholas, in your work, we see testing in the SAT and how the SAT test has really evolved um, to have once captured low-income students who may not have been able to, uh, been on the radar for elite universities, and now it has morphed into a different kind of test where affluent middle-class students are preparing for the test and that the score then um, is not necessarily a measure of promise or talent, but is a measure of preparation. And um, how really when you control for socioeconomic status, the SAT test only accounts for 2.7% of variation in grades in freshman year. So I think I'm, I'm more skeptical about testing as and the results of a test to measure innate ability or promise. So now, now we're going to get really cosmic for a minute here. So um, Adrian, you mentioned Michael Young. And I, um, when I was working on my book, I spent a day with him in the 90s. He's no longer with us. And one thing I remember is I said, where did you come up with this word meritocracy? And he said, well, you know, what I realized is that aristocracy actually means the same thing as meritocracy. 
it's a Greek word. It means rule by the best. Um, and the problem is everybody by the time, you know, we got to the 20th century and way before understood aristocracy to mean rule by inheritors, right? So therefore he said, I had to, you know, break the rules and combine a Latin prefix with a Greek suffix. Like because, television. Yes. <laughs> because the word had degraded in meaning. Yeah. Now, you know, the, the question this raises is, um, you know, in the book you talk about Plato's Republic and in the Republic, you know, he had children actually taken away from their parents to yeah. avoid the phenomenon, which I plead very guilty to, of parents trying to confer whatever advantage they have on their children. That's kind of human nature, I guess. Um, yeah. uh, so, uh, you know, beyond IQ tests, I mean, some of what, what Jennifer just said can be applied more broadly. And John Adams, you know, you quote, say things like this too, whatever you define as merit, if you define as merit, you know, having blue eyes or whatever, um, the fortunate part of society is going to figure out how to get blue eyes into their children. So, so in effect, all meritocracies would degrade into aristocracies. And this is what a lot of the anti-meritocracy people today, like Markovitz, are, are saying is happening. Sure. So, so I don't want to start with you, Adrian, because I started with you on the other questions, but uh, maybe Melissa, what, what, what do you think about aristocracy? Do, is it a good idea? Do we live in one now? What's the difference? Um, so much that you said there. Uh, I don't care what the standard is. This is this is what I heard you say, and I it's what I would have said because I think it's true. I don't care what the standard is. Someone can game it. If you have more wealth, if you're at, if you're better situated, you can game it because in fact that's what happens, right? And what we do is we live in exclusive neighborhoods and we exclude people from the best schools. The, there's food deserts. There's so many ways that we disadvantage others, and it doesn't matter what you test for. Um, and I would say the biggest example comes from my own household. I wasn't the best standardized test taker. I didn't know how to prepare. I was too lazy to do the work. Um, but I did well. And I went to Stanford Law School, partly because of diversity initiatives um, and partly because of the effort that Adrian talks about, maybe equal parts. My children, however, grew up in exclusively white Manhattan Beach, which is where my husband and I was able to get them. They are phenomenal test takers because they had an environment that allowed them to be phenomenal test takers. So they both tested in the 99th percentile for the SAT and got into every single school they applied to, inclu including Columbia. All right. And, and, um, then, then you think, well, maybe that's an anomaly, except my son just took the MCAT and again tested in the 95th percentile after 300 hours of effort. I don't care what test you use, just allow kids who look like them to do well too. That's, that's fundamentally the system. And if you don't allow kids who look like them, and mind you, this is 1%. There's nobody in this community who looks like us. It is literally that rare. So the system is failing because we actually believe that only white kids can do that. And it's not true, actually. That's my point. It's not true until the system looks like the society we're in. Until the top echelon looks like that, you know what you have. You have failure. And you can put an IQ test on it. You can put an SAT test on it. You can throw that test away and come up with another one. Until the system recognizes that everybody should be able to achieve, no matter your sexual orientation, your gender, your race, until we've accomplished that, we are failing, is, is my point. So I would call that, I always try to answer your question at the end, I would call that an aristocracy. Uh, and and you, can, you, can, you can label it whatever you want in terms of what input you use to measure, to measure um, the top 10. 
do either of the others of you want to come in on this aristocracy question? Jennifer, you look like you do. I do, yeah. I mean, I, I, I really appreciate everything that Melissa shared and, and actually bring um, her own experience to this discussion, which is really rich. And, and, and um, it, I start to think about a million things, but as a social, social scientist and a sociologist, I also fall back on data and studies to help illuminate some of her points. I mean, she's talking about um, really this fascinating um, concept in which because of her class status, she's able to confer certain kinds of advantages on her children, which is terrific. I think one of this also raises this interesting question of where do legacies fit into this debate? Yes, well. And this is where um, a recent study that was just published in the journal Labor Economics shows that over 43% of the white admits at Harvard, and Nick, you're in Cambridge, Massachusetts now, um, are, are the children of legacies, athletes, um, the children to your staff or on the special dean's list to our, our particular interest for whatever reason. And this is what's even more interesting that given the particular meritocratic system in which Harvard admits students, that three quarters would not have been admitted if it weren't for their particular status of legacy athlete, children of staff, faculty, and dean's list. And so I think one of the things we often forget in this question of meritocracy is who it serves and how it continues to reproduce in ways that advantage those who are already advantaged. Can I make two points here? Um, one is that Nick said, when we started off that he was talking from Cambridge, Massachusetts, which is the capital of meritocracy. <laughs> Maybe. I would say he's talking from Cambridge, Massachusetts, which is the cap, which is the capital of the degeneration of meritocracy <laughs> into something, something very different. Uh, and I just wanted to talk a little bit about Plato, uh, who is in many ways the originator of this idea. Um, and his notion of an aristocracy is precisely mm -hmm. the rule of the best. Uh, and he's very preoccupied by the idea that that the parents of gold will not have children of gold. They will have children who, as it were, regress to the mean, but they'll try and give them the opportunities right, right. of children of gold. And he wants to make sure that, as it were, the natural order is preserved and that only the best people get the, the, the jobs that are appropriate to them. And he mm -hmm. says that because, because of human nature, because of the desire of parents to do their best for their children, you have to do very radical things. Right. to um, allow for that. You have to do two radical things in particular. You have to have communal childbearing. You can't have marriage. And he says the only way you can generate <laughs> children is through state-sponsored orgies so that people don't know who, they're, who the, the, the progenitors <laughs> of the children are. They just only know one of them. And you, you, can't allow to, you can't have property. You can't have property rights because also people will use public offices to try and accumulate uh, property. And although those... That view is very, very extreme and not something that I would advocate or any sane person would ad advocate. Nevertheless, he is pointing to, the, to some real tensions that people who have privileges will transmit those privileges to their children. And in a knowledge based society, that will take the form of hoarding educational opportunities. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that if we're serious about meritocracy, we have to take this, we have to do our very best to break this connection. And what we're getting now is the opposite of that. We're getting a very dangerous marriage between plutocracy and meritocracy. People buy educational privileges, which gets them to the top of society, um, and they hoard those educational privileges through money. So what we need to have is various mechanisms, not as extreme as Plato's, but mechanisms designed to break those links so we discover real talent wherever it is in society. Now, the very least that we can do is get rid of legacies and athlete, the dean's list and, uh, and, uh, and athletic admissions and the rest of it. And I have absolute and unqualified contempt for Harvard and any, any faculty member who, who, who participates in this system, whether they write books denouncing merit or not, I think that's absolutely appalling. But I think we need to do more than that. We need to look for better ways the best ways possible of finding promise wherever it is in society. And I think we're on the verge 
of being able to discover new ways of doing that, more powerful ways uh, and less class-based ways than um, IQ tests. For example, there's a geneticist called Robert Plowman who claims that you can now identify a series of genetic markers in newborn children, which can predict with extraordinary degrees of accuracy their long-term development, their long-term capacities. Now, that raises all sorts of <laughs> terrible things, but it also raises some very interesting things that we'll be able to find within poor populations, hidden talent much more efficiently than we ever have been before. And the other thing I would point to is the value of some sort of educational selection. And Britain has been extremely successful in creating academy schools, very educationally uh, selective, academically rigorous schools, which operate in poor areas uh, such as East London. And there are some of these academy schools which have high proportions of children, majorities of children who have free school meals, which is a measure of poverty, majorities of children who come from ethnic minorities who, who go onto Oxford and Cambridge. And one of these schools actually every year now for several years has got more children into Oxford and Cambridge than Eton College has. So I think, you know, these, these measures of... Searching the population for capacity and providing enriched education for people from poorer backgrounds can bring us closer to the ideal of, 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 of a meritocracy. Um, let me go in a slightly different direction for a few minutes. Um, and and it, it kind of goes back to what you're saying about the Republic or one aspect of it. As, as you point out in the book correctly, a lot of these earlier sort of testing systems that we, you know, they weren't called meritocratic at the time they were developed because the word didn't exist, um, were really done to select people for civil service jobs. Yeah. This is true in the you know, Confucian societies. It's true in much of Western Europe. Um, and there's something at least a little platonic about that because you're, you're selecting pe people you know, and I'm, I'm saying this with great awareness of all the flaws of what I'm saying, you're selecting people to devote their lives to public service and be relatively selfless, at least in the pecuniary sense. Um, but in the American system now, when you have, you know, according to at least urban legend, 75% of the students at Stanford are in either computer science or economics, um, you're really selecting people for very rich, economic rewards. Um, and Melissa, you know these statistics about in the in the 50s and 60s, the ratio of the CAO, CEO's pay to the workers' pay was one thing, and today it's way different. So um, is it, what are the meritocrats, the elite types that are chosen in these selection systems, what do they owe the rest of us? I'd like to start with that one. Um, well, first of all, so we, I think we agree that while we aspire to it, um, we don't live in a meritocracy. I dare say we don't even live in a democracy with all of the inequities. Um, but I think what we do live in is a kleptocracy. I think there's a lot of theft that frankly happens and uh, it's, it's, our, it's the folks in political power, but it's also individuals because to Adrian's point, while, um, while extreme, uh, Pluto was onto something and that is when you gather wealth, no matter how the prior generation got it, no matter if they stole it, which often is the case, it's yours and you believe that you're entitled to hand it to your children. Again, it doesn't matter how you got it. Doesn't matter who didn't get to eat because of the sins of your forefathers. And I think the reality is until we deal with our history for what it really is, Adrian, people of lower socioeconomic um, backgrounds are not hidden. They're absolutely in plain sight. They're not hidden. You don't need an IQ test to go find them. They're readily available and they want to participate and they want to go to the best schools and they want to drive Teslas and have the, they, they're, they're not, they don't think they're hidden. No, they're right there in plain sight. The problem is we only shine the looking glass at certain um, 
uh, pieces of our society. And we all look into that looking glass, you know, to Jennifer's point, we're all looking at that looking glass at that specific uh, demographic. And it's the folks who go to the best schools, it's the folks who live in the best neighborhoods, but those who are outside of that, uh, outside of that looking glass, they're not hidden. It's just we've chosen to focus the mirror, I think, on a very narrow um, sort of Eurocentric, history Latin, um, defective. It's a, it's a really, really defective lens. And it's unfortunate because, because we do that, we miss really a, a rich, vibrant workforce. Um, a rich, vibrant talent pool. We're, they're there. We just have created so many traps that make it nearly impossible um, for them to get up and into that, you know, top 10% or whatever we want to call it. Anybody else want to come in on this? Yeah, topic? I would. I mean, I'm always inspired after hearing Alicia, but I wanted to, again, as a sociologist, bring in some other research. So we've been talking a lot about getting into elite universities as if that is the solution. A lot of research shows that even upon graduation, experimental studies show that even people with the same resume, when you change the name to connote particular racial identification, when you change gender, when you change um, signal motherhood versus fatherhood, you have incredibly different outcomes. So you have women being called back to a lesser extent than men for positions, even when their resumes and grades. And in fact, high achieving women are penalized because they're high achieving and perceived as unlikable and arrogant. You have men, African-American men, graduating from elite universities who are not called back at the same rate as their white male counterparts who graduate from the same elite universities and have the same academic records. You have mothers who are penalized because of their motherhood status while fathers are actually rewarded. So I mentioned this because Adrian in his initial definition of meritocracy said without bias. And we often think of this question of meritocracy focusing just on the domain of education. And I wanted to broaden this discussion a bit to think about Okay, even if we are able to create a system and funnel people into educational systems and into the top universities in an equitable way, that doesn't guarantee that the outcomes in the labor market will be at all equitable. And I also think about who gets promoted, who gets into the leadership positions. And this is where um, research also shows that Asian Americans even though they're able to get into professional jobs, they are stalling in terms of advancement. They are not represented as executives, as managers in the C-suite. So I mentioned this to kind of bring a lot back together and, and again, signaling um, Adrian's initial point about meritocracy free of bias and and to really broaden the debate beyond just education, thinking about the labor market, where, where we also think we live in a meritocratic ideal. So uh, questions are pouring in from the audience. So I want to switch to that really soon. But just one quick round on, you know, this is too big a question to do in a quick round. But you, you've all pointed out in various ways flaws, that, that, that there's an appealing ideal here that we're not at in reality. Um, if, if we could fix the system, what would fix it? What, what, would, what, what should we be thinking about doing? Well, I personally think that the most important thing to do at the moment, at this, uh, at this point in time, is to um, deal with the problems of opportunity hoarding um, and deal with the marriage of meritocracy with plutocracy. And that means, in my view, making a much more serious effort to provide enriched education to people of talent wherever they are, particularly in the very early years. And secondly, to do as much as you can to distinguish between achievement and promise mm -hmm. and find ways of, of discovering uh, promise in the, in, in the system. 
Um, let me just push back a little bit on this because the, as these folk, these discussions do, this gets focused on elite educational opportunities. Yeah. Um, so in the US, there's something like 3,500 institutions that grant a bachelor's degree. Of those, something like 50 are highly selective and they take in a tiny, you know, important, but statistically not that big part of the population. So let's stipulate that somehow we could fix the elite university admission problem. We get rid of legacy, we get rid of athletes, we, whatever we did. I don't think it can be fixed myself, but that's a different discussion. What would we do to make life better for everybody else once we'd fixed elite university admissions? Well, I personally think that the biggest problem, the biggest problem, one of the big problems confronting American education at the moment is a sort of academic drift, whereby the only sort of virtue or merit that is really focused on is academic merit. And, you know, you have first class, second class or third class Acad uh, people of academic merit, and then there's then there's everybody. Well, there are sports stars who do their thing, but um, and I think we need to do much more to acknowledge the importance of, of practical skills, uh, and much more to acknowledge the importance of caring skills, uh, because we live in a society in which caring is going to become uh, ever ever more important as we have an aging society, and 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 we all of of my generation start to fall apart. Um, and um, also, as we have a mechanization of a lot of production, you know, we, we're going to have people who, 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 who need to do what only human beings can do. Uh, Melicia and Jennifer, what would you do to fix our unachieved or broken meritocracy? You want to go first, Jennifer? No, no, I, I'm always inspired after hearing you, so I'll let you go first. <laughs> Okay, that's a that's a tall order. Uh, so I think the, the there's a few things that I think are working. They're not working perfectly, but I would encourage us to continue with. I actually like quotas. I know that's a bad word, but I do. I like the fact that we are taking publicly traded boards, which were typically all white men, and saying, guess what? You have to go find a woman and you need to go find a person of color. I actually think there's a forcing function there that's very powerful and effective. And to the naysayers who say, well, they're not qualified, Trust me, there were a lot of men on those boards who weren't qualified either. They knew someone. That's usually how you get on those boards. That's not a meritocracy. We called it that, but that's not really what it is. So it's okay to end up with some duds and some folks who don't work out. I think the forcing function is important because that you have to open the gate somewhere. So I'm a big believer of quotas and not only with boards, I think companies that in the wake of George Floyd and even before it, who said, we have a diversity problem. I think that eye-opening view of the world is really important. And if you're, you should reach into then your employee base and pull people up. Again, it's okay that there are gonna be some duds and some failures. You need to be intentional about opening up the this false um, environment we've been in that have allowed power and wealth and, and success to pull among a few. And then I think you go all the way to the other end to my point that you start with the cradle and you give those three and four and five year olds the chance that we're not giving them yet. Because at that point, um, what I love about children, and I think we all know this, they, they don't know not to believe in themselves. Someone has to tell them not to believe in themselves, right? And it's not just what happens in school, though. It's not just school lunch. We just have to know it's what's going on in the household. It's the opportunities their parents are or aren't getting. You have to peel it all apart. It's the environments they're in, the schools they're going to. But I do think at, at the theater pool, we've got to change how we treat um, the, the babies. And I think there's a lot of efforts by people smarter than I to fix that. And we've got to continue to pour money in at that end. Um, so over over the Jennifer. Okay, um, I, I just would, as a quick note, remember that in 1978, the Supreme Court was one vote short of endorsing quotas, one vote shifted. <laughs> that would have been the law of the land, uh, but it, it went the other way. And so there's this big thing about the the, 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 the ultimate evil. So. Um, anyway, Jennifer. 
Yeah, I'm, um, I'm again, I, I've been so excited by this discussion. I feel like we can go and so we can talk for hours about this. Um, I was thinking a lot about the current debate of affirmative action and the current culture war on affirmative action that's taking place now and how affirmative action, how many people misunderstand what it is. And actually, to Melissa's point, it's not a quota. It's actually so much more benign than a quota. It's allowing institutions to consider race, ethnicity, and among a myriad of factors to create a class, a university class, um, a workforce, however you want to think of it. I think defending affirmative action and firmly defending affirmative action is an important part of um, fostering uh, fostering, uh, a more meritocratic system. The other thing I wanted to point to was we have been talking a lot about elite universities, as Nick mentioned, and I think there is this perception that Um, The majority of Asian Americans, for instance, are attending elite universities. But if you look at the state of California, one of the things that surprises most people is that they're not going to the top universities. Most Asian Americans, actually the majority of them are in community colleges. Over 50% are in community colleges. Um, A quarter in the UC system, a quarter in the Cal State system. Um, When I think about what we can do about making equal opportunity more of a reality is thinking about investing in those community colleges and investing in uh, colleges that actually serve the greater population rather than thinking about the kind of debates that we're having just about elite universities. And and I think about that for pipeline, I think about canceling student debt and what that would do for opportunities of students who are working class or from more disadvantaged backgrounds who haven't had um, the help of their parents to pay their way through college. So I think of a lot of structural um, ideas that would help the majority of students regardless of um, social origin. And just Nicholas, let's throw in the can... mix uh, there that the U.S. has 15,000 separate independently controlled school districts that are primarily funded by real estate taxes. So that's part of the same picture. And Nicholas, if I could just add one one um, sort of cliff note to what Jennifer said. Um, when you talk about quotas and affirmative action, the reason why I'm comfortable with it is because affirmative action and quotas have existed in the U.S. society for 500 years. When you declare people who look like me to be three-fifths of a person, you're giving someone else affirmative action. And so I... I I don't have a problem with it. I think that is how we got here. That is why the system is broken and why we have misperceptions about Asian Americans and Black Americans is because we have been practicing affirmative action and quotas for forever, just not towards the people who have been disadvantaged. So I just wanted to to echo that it's not, it's those are not dirty phrases to me. Okay, so now I'm gonna start throwing out questions from the audience. Um, and uh, I, I don't necessarily, I, I, I'm, I, we're, we're going to start uh, thinking you all will sort of apportion yourselves among the answerers without my designating somebody to answer, okay? Um, so, uh, is the focus on talent a mistake? What about character, integrity, honesty? essential qualities that are often punished by society and for which there's no SAT or ACT. We have rampant credentialism in the United States. Would it be more appropriate to have simulated situation tests for certain jobs rather than degrees from higher learning institutions? Please define talent as you're all using the term unproblematically. Uh, Could you give some examples of measuring potential, please? Was that all one question? Uh, I think I may have mixed two questions, but it was it was a 
you know, questions that are kissing cousins of each other. Okay. I'll start with the first one. I, whomever said that, in my opinion, was just raised right. That's how my grandmother would have said it. If, if we're raising the right kind of citizens, I absolutely agree with that. My, my best job as a mother and my biggest accomplishment is to raise kids who are honest, with integrity, who aren't arriving at school because they cheated, right? Who know how to open doors for seniors and everyone in between. I mean, I, I agree that that stuff matters. Um, I don't know that it is a replacement for um, effort and, and sheer talent, um, but I do think that those are the compliments that frankly should, should secure your place and frankly um, help with your trajectory. I see, I, I believe that if someone is, is not ethical and honest, they shouldn't last long. They shouldn't make it all the way up the totem pole. I don't know if that's true. I think there are people who would disagree with me, but um, I, I guess my point is that I subscribe to those principles. I don't think it's a zero sum game though. I, I agree. I believe that that should be part of maybe Adrian's IQ test, quite honestly. Why, why aren't we measuring honesty and integrity along with just sheer um, grit and, and ability? I think if you look at the history of notions of merit, going all the way back to Plato, for most of, the, for most of history, people have talked about um, virtues and talents. Jefferson and the rest of the founding fathers in particular talked about virtues and talents, the same with the, the, the philosophers of the Enlightenment, Voltaire. It's only really when you come to the 20th century, particularly the middle of the 20th century, that you have this sort of demoralization of the language of discussion of talent and people start focusing very exclusively on intellectual ability and IQ and ignoring the virtues and talent side. And they do that for, for both good reasons and, and bad reasons. The, the bad reason is that they almost conflate character and IQ and they think anybody who's really clever is probably gonna be uh, morally virtuous, which is as we can see from uh, uh, the, the, his, the history of American corporate scandals, certainly, certainly not the case. Yeah. Um, but certainly there is a good reason. And the good reason is that character was very often used as a way of getting nice but dim members of the WASP elite into elite institutions. You could say, well, he's, he's, you know, he's a bit thick but he's a really good chap, he's honest, he's nice and all of that sort of stuff. Uh, and you know, the, the sort of uh, Yale that was celebrated, um, you know, in, 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 the 19, in, in the 1920s, um, you know, was an institution which chose people on the basis of character, which was another way of saying upper class wasp. So that is a problem. On the issue of, 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 of what is talent, um, very, very difficult to answer. There are clearly multiple talents. It's a plural thing, you know, a talent for music may be correlated with the talent for mathematics, but it's not exactly the same thing. But I do think that we need to have an attempt to look, uh, when we're looking for education, educational, to the allocation of educational opportunities, we need to have a ten, a, 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 an ability to look for cognitive potential. Um, because cognitive potential measures the extent to which you're going to profit from educational opportunity. Um, and so these, I've talked about IQ tests are also, as I say, more and more fundamental ways of looking at the genetics of, uh, of these things. And I think to look for, for promise is something that we're fundamentally bound to, bound to do if we want to make a sense of meritocracy. Let me um, throw out an, another couple of questions. And, and just as a prelude, this is really a topic that we need to talk about in our last few minutes we haven't talked about, which is the tremendous amount of sort of populist anti-meritocrat energy out there on both the left and the right these days. You know, Michael Young's book on meritocracy, as you know, uh, Adrian, ended with the meritocrats being massacred by the non-meritocrats. And it, um, we haven't gotten there yet, but I'll just read a couple questions in that line. Do you see a connection between the growing threats to democracy and systems that reward the winner in so many societies? Should those who have, who who should those who have merit dominate politics? Where do those without measures of merit get their voices heard? Can they lead? Um, I think 
uh, who, who's sort of next in line to answer? Uh, Jennifer? Yeah, no, I, I, I guess I was st still stuck on the earlier question about character. And so I'd like to uh, actually just m make a note about character and then uh, punt it to Malicia to talk about the other questions. But I wanted to follow up on something Adrian said that I thought was really terrific about character is the, the person who asked the question about character was talking about, shall we not reward particular characteristics and, and, and like empathy and kindness, which are absolutely um, essential in a society. I think one of the dangers of defining characters and thinking about characteristics, as Adrian said, is character has often been used to exclude certain populations. So character, uh, thinking about a good character in elite universities has been used as a ploy to exclude Jewish applicants in the early 20th century. So I think how we define character and the characteristics that lead to certain kinds of opportunities is an important one. Um, I'm still thinking I, the other questions. Yeah, I, I just want to add a little footnote to this from my book research long ago. Yeah. You know, uh, when I was working on the book, uh, Henry Chauncey, the first president of, of Educational Testing Service was still alive. He lived to the age of 96, 97. Um, so uh, he believed that testing could solve all problems. So when confronted with this, he would say, well, we'll just invent more tests. We'll invent a test for character. We'll invent a test for kindness. We'll invent a test for a sense of humor. And, and he was constantly trying to come up with these other tests. So instead of having this one big test, you'd have a million tests of everything. Now, if he had succeeded, you'd have test prep industries for the test of character too, right? But that's another story. Um, Alicia, over to you. Oh, I, I was going to punt it right on over to Adrian, who seems to have the most, the broadest bench when it comes to these issues. And um, and the last question, I know one of them was, you know, what are those without merit or something to that effect? Nicholas, what are they to do? So Adrian, maybe you can start with that. Well, look, the, 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 this was the essence of, uh, of um, the rise of the meritocracy by Michael Young. What Michael Young's, Michael Young's objection to meritocracy was not that we weren't realizing this wonderful ideal, which is meritocracy. His objection was that meritocracy is an incredibly cruel thing because it means that the people who reach the top of society do say on their own merits and are therefore intolerably smug and self-confident because they know they should be there. And the people who are stuck at the bottom of society are also intolerably miserable because they know that they should be at the bottom of society. So he was saying, you know, meritocracy is a bad ideal. It's, it, 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 it's a perversion of what basically. a good society would be. And I think what we're seeing now um, is a very interesting backlash against the meritocratic idea. It's not one I agree with, but it's one that I think has a lot of substance um, and, and, and involves a lot of interesting moral questions that, that, that what we have is a credentialed elite which is very different from the old landed elite. It can point to its educational qualifications as reasons why, why it is. And a sense of people at the bottom that perhaps they're being excluded from power and opportunity uh, for, for reasons that may be beyond their control, but do reflect their ability to contribute to, 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 to the overall productivity of society. So you have a rage and a rage that is rooted in a sense of hopelessness at the bottom of society. And we saw it in Brexit in Britain, where the people who got the lowest educational qualifications uh, voted overwhelming for Brexit. We saw it with Trump when Trump said, you know, I love the, the, love the uneducated. And this raises the possibility that we are in this highly stratified, highly credential oriented society in which people who don't make it according to the rules of that system um, are, have a sense of hopelessness and in their hopelessness, just want to tear the whole thing down. Um, it is now 3.59, 3.58, so, and we have to leave at four. Um, so I think what I'm going to ask is if anybody has quick final words to add before we get to the top of the hour when we have to leave. If not, I'll say just what, a little bit of what I was saying before. Michael Young was a socialist, so he, he was against meritocracy because he thought it would 
provide a, a um, pretext for inequality. Um, what he said when I interviewed him was, he said, you know what a good society needs? It needs a fault. He liked the British aristocracy because it was so obviously unfair yeah. that it could leave an opening to socialists to win. And, and he thought that if you had a society where there was at least the appearance of fairness, and some of that has degraded, as we've all noted, then you'd lose the sort of left-wing energy that was what he prized the most. That's a whole other discussion too. We should That's probably right. all gather again and have another hour on, on meritocracy. But anyway, this has been a lot of fun. And um, thanks to all of you for participating. Thanks to all of you in the audience and thanks to Zocalo for sponsoring this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.